Let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. We want to sort of take a look at the Beatitudes tonight as a whole, before we start looking at them separately. And our goal is to catch the spirit of the message of Jesus. There are many who seek to discover the technical aspects of the sermon. And they spend volumes on seeking to determine just how many Beatitudes are there. Are there seven, or are there eight, or are there nine? And you can get into your theological discussions and debates over just how many Beatitudes there are. We don't care as far as how many there are. What do they say to me is what's important. Do they really describe what I am? Is this a description of me as I read these Beatitudes? In this sermon, Jesus is emphasizing the the superiority of the spiritual life over the material life. This was the emphasis of the teaching of Jesus all the way through. That living after the Spirit was superior to living after the flesh. Now, that is the opposite attitude of the world, which places so much emphasis upon the flesh and living after the flesh. But Jesus emphasized that it was superior, far superior, to live after the Spirit. As we get into the Beatitudes and as we get into the sermon, we're going to discover that the emphasis is more on what you are than what you do. The attitude behind the actions is what Jesus is going to be interested in. So someone has said these are be-attitudes rather than do-attitudes. And uh, so much of what we hear today is the emphasis upon what we should be doing, but Jesus emphasized what we should be. And the Beatitudes actually describe the general character of the Christian. We want to look at the whole before we see the individual parts. As we mentioned last week, it's much easier to understand the puzzle if you have the whole picture in front of you rather than just trying to study the individual parts. Heresy usually arises from looking at individual parts without noting how they relate to the whole. People take a part of this scripture and a part of that scripture, and they seek to form a doctrine I've had people quote to me, but the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And they sought to prove salvation by works. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And quite often, as they are trying to emphasize the importance of works, they'll quote that scripture, but they don't 
quote the rest of the scripture. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you see, when you finish the scripture, it puts a whole different light on it because it emphasizes it is God that's working in you. He is the one that gives you the will and then the ability to do. It is he that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Quite often as they are arguing on the subject of baptismal regeneration, that you are saved by baptism. And then until you are baptized in water, you're not saved. But you are saved by the ritual of baptism in water. And they'll so often quote from Peter, where he says, in the like figure whereunto baptism doth now save us. And they use that as their proof text. But again, they don't read the whole scripture. It's only a part of the scripture. For Peter went on to say, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, not the outward ritual, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. In other words, it's the inward work of the Holy Spirit. The word blessed, as we have pointed out in the past, literally means happy. The only truly happy man is the man who possesses the characteristics that are described here in the Beatitudes. It's interesting to me that happiness is the great issue of the day. All of mankind, it seems, is striving for happiness. In our Bill of Rights, we declare that each person has the right for life, for liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And men, it seems, are constantly pursuing happiness. Why is it that there is that constant pursuit of happiness? Because a person hasn't yet attained it. If you have found happiness, you're no longer pursuing happiness. You now have happiness. And so Jesus is describing here and showing you the characteristics of the man who is a truly happy man. There are many things that bring temporary happiness, but long-term misery. On the surface, at the beginning, it gives such great promise of happiness. I finally discovered the path. But it often ends in abject misery. The man who frequents the bar for the so-called happy hour. You see how they're looking for happiness. But as he becomes addicted to the alcohol, he loses his family, he loses his job, he loses his self-respect. He ends up in the gutters of Skid Row, not a happy person, eating out of trash barrels, looking for bottles and hoping that there's a few drops of the contents left. But it's misery. And so many of the deceitfulness of sin, and, and that's where the deceitfulness is, because Satan holds it up and he dangles it and he says, look, 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 this will make you happy. And people are attracted and allured to Satan's bait. But it ends in misery. Jesus says, this is the way of happiness. And this is the character of the man 
who is truly happy, blessed, or happy. As we look at these Beatitudes, we conclude that Jesus intends that all Christians should be like this. He's not describing just a few super saintly kind of people. As you read through these Beatitudes, these are the characteristics that the Lord wants in your life. And as you submit and surrender your life to him, these are the things that will begin to come forth in your life. There is a wrong tendency to divide Christians into two categories, the priesthood and the laity, the minister and the the congregation. And unfortunately, we so often look upon people who are in the ministry as, well, yes, the characteristics of the Christian should be in them, but I have to live in the world and I have to go to work and You know, it isn't practical for me. So there comes that separation created by man that is absolutely wrong. Jesus isn't just talking about those who are in the ministry. He's talking about those who profess to be Christians. These are the characteristics that God wants to bring to pass in your life. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, has made a practice of canonizing certain people and calling them saints. And that's tragic because it infers that there are some people that are in a special category of Christianity. The New Testament canonizes all of us. And we don't have to have some kind of a proclamation or decree to make us saints. Paul, in writing to the churches of Rome and Corinth, writes to those who are called saints. And so, like it or not, I'm St. Charles and... That's what God's called me to be. And he's called you to be a saint. The New Testament canonizes all of us. Over and over again, God declares that he's no respecter of persons. And the elevating of one man above another in a spiritual kind of a ranking is of man and it is not of God. All believers are to manifest all of these characteristics that we find here in the Beatitudes. Now, they are not like the gifts of the Spirit. When Paul writes concerning the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, and talking about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, he said the Holy Spirit divides to each man severally as he wills. So not all are prophets, not all are apostles, not all are workers of uh, miracles, not all have the gifts of healing, not all speak with tongues. But with the Beatitudes, these are meant for each of us. All of us should possess these characteristics. It isn't that one man is poor in spirit and another man has a gift of weeping while another has the gift of being a peacemaker. We are all of us to be all of these things. There are times when some people seem to manifest some of the characteristics more than others. 
But that only means that God hasn't yet been given full control over that area where the manifestations are not there. The Beatitudes are actually interrelated. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we get into the description of what it is to be poor in spirit, we will discover that it is the proper evaluation of yourself in the light of God or seeing yourself in the light of God. That the effect of that is always poor in spirit. And when I, you see, so many times we're trying to give off to others sort of an aura of holiness and godliness and we love people to look at us and say, oh my, they're such a spiritual giant. Oh, don't you love that? Spiritual giant. I mean, boy, the flesh really, you know, picks up on that one. And, and sometimes I think that a person can uh, even begin to think of himself as sort of, uh, well, he wants a big S, uh, you know, on the T-shirt for super saint, you know. And uh, we, we take on affectations. Uh, it, it begins to reflect in our voice. And, you know, you hold your hand and you sort of tilt your head, you know. And, and oh, you know, and you can say, oh, yes, oh, my, you know. And people say, Ooh, I, I wish I were holy like that, you know. And, and, and a person begins to think, well, yeah, I guess I am pretty nice, you know, pretty good, and coming along, you know. That's not poor in spirit. But when you really see yourself as God sees you, it brings you to tears. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, and that leads to the next one. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And, of course, they, they progress right along. It, it leads you to a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. And then it, my attitude towards others is reflected. And, and so we'll see how the Beatitudes are actually interrelated so that they build on each other. Now, Jesus is not describing natural characteristics. There are people with different temperaments, and some people are naturally sweet, while others find it a real effort to be sweet. They're naturally sour. And Jesus isn't talking about natural characteristics. These Beatitudes are not a part of a person's natural character, which has nothing to do with your spirituality. You can observe different kinds of natures in dogs. There are some dogs that are vicious. And there are other dogs that have sort of a sweet temperament. And so those things are, are not spiritual. We're talking about this work of the Holy Spirit within our lives. These are things that I cannot attain or achieve by my effort I cannot say, well, I'm going to be poor in spirit. And uh, it doesn't work. This is the work of God's spirit within me. And as we get into it, you'll observe and see how uh, this works out. You see, when God created us, he created us all different. Just look around, and none of us look like each other. God created us different. I'm always amazed at 
what a tremendous variety God can get out of basic things. I mean, basically, we all have two eyes and a nose and a mouth and, and all. And yet, look at the variety that God has created uh, with, with just, you know, a limited number of basics. But yet, the variety that God has brought out of it is absolutely fantastic. And even as we have different appearances, so we have different temperaments. But he's describing the character that is developed in a man by the new birth and the work of the Holy Spirit within his life. I am not any of these things naturally. You may come across a person who is an atheist, who is very kind, and he is a peacemaker, though he doesn't believe in God. And we often hear people say, well, I met someone the other day, you know, and they're really a better Christian than most Christians I know. Wrong. The natural temperament has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Each of us have to come to God the same way as a hopeless, helpless sinner and seek the forgiveness and the grace of God, knowing that he is merciful. There's a lot of confusion at this point. These things that Jesus is talking about are things that are not developed or are part of a man naturally. They are things that are developed by the Holy Spirit within his life. These Beatitudes show to us the great difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. It is a sad indictment against the church that the distinctions between a Christian and a non-Christian are becoming least or less all of the time. There's less of a distinction between the believer and the non-believer. That only is an indictment against the church and against Christianity. The Christian is not to be like the world. It isn't that the worldly person is becoming more like the Christian, but unfortunately, the Christians are becoming more like the world. I think that television probably has a, a great uh, influence upon our whole culture, even the Christian culture. And that as Christians, we many times will watch things in our own homes that the church of the last century would have considered appalling and totally sinful. Christians will go to movies. I heard so many people, even ministers, talking about Titanic. Well, I read, thank God I didn't go and see, but I read that there's some pretty prolonged nude scenes in Titanic. I do know that in most movies, there's just a lot of vulgarity and blasphemy. And yet Christians will go and absorb that. So the separation or the distinctions between the believer and the non-believer are becoming less all the time. But as we get into the Beatitudes, we'll see that this, this really marks the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. I think that there are too many that want to see how much of the world they can enjoy while still maintaining a relationship with Jesus Christ rather than seeing just how close can I get to Jesus Christ. You see, one of the techniques of mind control 
is shocking people, shocking their senses. And so when you go into the mind control groups or cults, they will use all kinds of vile, foul, filthy language. They'll call you all kinds of names. And at the beginning, it's absolutely shocking. Your senses are totally shocked. But soon, the shock is gone and you're desensitized to these things. But it's a process of breaking down the standards in your mind and then the reprogramming. And so we see in the church there's so much of the world that has come in and been introduced. There are Christians that engage in social drinking. And there's really not much of a distinction between some of these social Christians and the world itself. The line of demarcation is getting smeared. About the only difference between many Christians and the worldling is that the Christian goes to church on Sunday morning and the worldling goes out and plays golf. But outside of that, there's not much difference in their lifestyles. Today in the church, there is developed tremendously strong pressure to make the church as unchurchy as possible. There are certain words that become taboo from the pulpit. The word sin or the word hell. Because, you see, we don't want to make the worldly person feel uncomfortable in church. And the last thing we want to do is make them feel guilty. We don't want to sing any songs that have to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. It might be offensive to the non-believer. And we want to create such a worldly environment in the, in the church that a person isn't really aware that he's in church. It's just a, another form of entertainment with a good moral in the story. I know of the arguments that we have to be more like the world in order to attract the world to Jesus. But if I fell down in a well and someone would, and I'd start screaming for help and someone would look down in and say, what's your problem? I fell down the well here. I don't want him to jump in beside me and say, well, let's figure this out together. Two heads are better than one. I want him to stay up on top, bring me up to his level. And I don't think you win the world by getting down to their level. I think that we need to maintain the standards and bring men up to the standards rather than reducing ours in order to somehow communicate better. The Christian and the non-Christian are absolutely different in the things that they admire. Take a look at the very first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's exactly opposite of the type of a person that the world admires today. The world admires a go-getter. The man who asserts himself. In fact, they even have self-asserting classes. Learn how to assert yourself. Learn how to, you know, promote yourself. And, and the world is, is saying, you know, promote yourself. Assert yourself. Be aggressive. And the world holds in admiration the man who has pushed his way to the top. 
They admire self-confidence. And even within the church, there's a big push towards self-esteem. Some even calling that born again. They say that being born again means that you now have a better self-esteem. You think more highly now of yourself. The poem Invictus by William Henley is a good example of what the world admires. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Beneath the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this space of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And the world stands up and applauds because I did it my way. There's a vast difference between the Christian and the non-Christian in the things that they seek. In the third beatitude, Jesus said, Blessed are they, or I guess it's the fourth, that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The worldly man hungers and thirsts for fame, for fortune, for position, for power, where the Christian thirsts for righteousness. There's a difference between the Christian and non-Christian in the things that they do. But here's the sad commentary. The worldly man is completely consistent with how he lives. He says that this world is all you're going to get. So I'm out to get as much of the world as I can. That's consistency. Unfortunately, the Christian isn't that consistent. He says, the world is not all that you're going to get. There's a better world coming. But then he turns around so often and lives like this world is all there is. And lays up all of his treasures here and none in heaven. The Christian and the non-Christian live in entirely different realms. It's interesting, both in the first and in the last beatitude, the promise is for the kingdom of heaven. The Christian is aware that he is a stranger and he's a pilgrim here on the earth. Paul said, for our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who when he comes, he's going to change these vile bodies that they might be fashioned like his own glorious image. But the consciousness, my citizenship is in heaven. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. I don't belong here. I'm an alien. This past week in our reading in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you or beg you as strangers and pilgrims Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul, having your manner of life honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they may speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The non-Christian lives in the world of darkness. The God of this world is holding him as a captive and has blinded his eyes so that he cannot see the truth. And if you feel at home in this world, then you had better examine your relationship with the Lord. The Christian and the non-Christian have an entirely 
different future. To the Christian, Jesus will say, Come, ye blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and they shall live and reign with him forever and ever. But the non-Christian, Jesus will say, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It is my prayer and my hope that as we move through this Sermon on the Mount, that God will use it as a light to shine into the dark recesses of our hearts. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But I'm praying that the Lord will reveal to us our hearts. And the very first response when you see yourself in the light of God's holiness, when you see yourself in the light of God's presence, you'll get an entirely different view of yourself. And the first thing will be the poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a good place to come for your starting now on the new path, but it begins with that poverty of spirit. And so next week we'll get started with blessed are the poor in spirit and the glorious promise, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will work mightily in our hearts as we launch into this study of probably the most important sermon ever preached. The words of Jesus, the great manifesto in which he declares the kingdom of God and those who will be a part of that kingdom. And Lord, you know it's our heart's desire and prayer to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and to spend eternity in the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, we pray that as we launch into this study, you will bless it, and you will use it. And, Lord, when we finish this study, may there be a distinct difference between how we live and how the world around us lives. For may we, O God, dedicate our lives to live as you would have us to live, a life that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front tonight to pray with you, to pray for you. If you have any spiritual needs or physical needs, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Our Lord answers prayers. That's the real thrust for praying. So come on down and they're here to minister to you tonight. May the Lord be with you and bless you. And may the Lord help us as we begin the new year to really make a renewed commitment of ourselves. This could very well be the last year the church will have a ministry here on earth. (laughs) The Lord is coming soon. If that is so, we want to make it the greatest year ever. So pledging ourselves for an all-out effort to see the kingdom of God brought into many lives in this coming year. The Lord bless thee thee and keep thee. thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee 
and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you. This is the end of this message. If you would like further information on any of our products or to receive our free catalog, contact the Word for Today. The address is P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. Or you may reach us by our toll-free number, 1-800-272-WORD. That's 1-800-272-WORD.